Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, ATP Depletion, an Overlooked Concern of Rapid Hygiene Assessments. So this event, which is brought to you by Food Safety Magazine, is sponsored by Kikoman. I'm your moderator, Adrian Bloom, Editorial Director of Food Safety Magazine. Thanks for joining us today. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about our presenters today. First, we have Dr. Mikio Bakke, Dr. Scott Rankin, and also Marybeth Karczynski. Now, Dr. Mikio Bakke is the General Manager of the Marketing and Planning Division of Kikoman Biochemifa Company. He specializes in researching enzyme and fermentation technology. Dr. Bakke has developed new technology for an ATP test that can detect ATP plus ADP plus AMP, which is called Kikoman A3. Dr. Scott Rankin is a professor and chair of the Food Science Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research programs focus on the characterization of reaction chemistries involving small bioactive molecules, and he has published on these factors affecting food hygiene, such as equipment design and rapid hygiene assessment. Professor Rankin also leads numerous in-person and online training programs involving food processing and sanitation in support of regional processing companies. And finally, Mary Beth Karczynski has spent the majority of her career working with ATP technology for both sanitation and finished product testing. Her career in ATP began over 25 years ago with Lumac, one of the first companies to commercially introduce ATP as a valid test method in quality control laboratories worldwide. With a passion for food quality, she has collaborated with leading companies in the food and beverage industry to assist with the implementation of ATP as a testing tool. Now we'd also like you to we'd also like to remind you not to forget to submit your questions during the webinar. You can do that at any time during the presentation, just with that Q&A box on your console. And later in the program, our presenters will address as many of those questions as possible. Also, to let you know, today's event is being recorded and it will be archived on www.food-safety.com. So, and now I am excited to turn it over to today's first presenter, Dr. Mikio Bakke. Dr. Bakke, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm Mikio Bakke from Kikkoman. First, let me introduce Kikkoman in five minutes or more. So, do you know Kikkoman soy sauce? Kikkoman has been in, in soy sauce business for more than 100 years and sell our product worldwide. Kikkoman has 11 soy sauce manufacturing plants worldwide. In US, we have two plants in Wisconsin and California. By the way, I enjoyed working in Kikkoman USA R&D Laboratory in Wisconsin Madison as a researcher for three years, about five years ago. Then I collaborated with the next speaker, Dr. Rankin, for the study of saltiness enhancing effect of soy sauce. Now, I'm very excited about his lecture for the food safety in this seminar. Kikoman also has Del Monte business in Asia and Oceania. Oriental Foods wholesale business and health related business. Moreover, Kikoman has food safety, uh, food monitoring 
uh, hygiene test product. Now we can product pro, uh, we can provide uh, ATP hygiene monitoring test, microbiome test, including convenient and easy to use culturing method, urgent test, and histamine test. Many people wonder why Kikoman is in hygiene monitoring test business. We are also a food and beverage manufacturer and run our own general hospital. Therefore, like you, we are very interested in hygiene management and have developed the product that we would want to use. Kikoma started with hygiene monitoring tests and have been a soil. Uh, we have cultivated the fermentation technology and have been seeking the techno application of the technology. As a result, we can produce key enzymes in our uh, key enzymes for hygiene monitoring tests in our biochemical factory. We have started with ATP hygiene monitoring test and have been in that business for more than 30 years. To, uh, in, uh, to uh, improve the, uh, uh, sorry, we evolved the uh, ATP test. We uh, evolved to ATP plus AMP test and subsequently to our current ATP plus ADP plus AMP test that we call Kikoman A3 to achieve more reliable cleaning verification. We also improved the instrument for customer's convenience. Actually, one of our ATP detection systems has been listed in NASA technical handbooks. So what makes Kikoman A3 different? To improve the conventional ATP test, we combined two additional enzymatic reactions. ATP, uh, sorry, ADP is converted to ATP by pyruvate kinase and AMP is recycled to AM ATP by pyruvate also phosphate dikinase. Thus, we were able to is successfully establish the simultaneous detection of total adenylates. In the next presentation, Dr. Rankin will point out why this detection capability is very important and helps to improve your hygiene monitoring program. These innovations helped us win the renowned worldwide world renowned design awards and grow to become one of the largest ATP test suppliers in the world. We hope our product contributes to your food safety and sanitation programs. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, I will take 
the, the webinar over to Dr. Rankin for his presentation. Good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you're at. Um, my name is Scott Rankin, and it's an honor and a privilege to participate in this webinar. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the science and the studies that we've done looking at uh, uh, ATP and its applications and use for hygiene assessment. Just to get us all kind of warmed up, I thought I might start with a, kind of a, a survey or a little question here. A couple of questions, actually. We'll kind of see how this, uh, this goes here. But I thought I'd poll everyone today and just to recognize that these uh, re your responses are, are entirely confidential and not tied to your to you, your company or anything. And the question, first question is, what is what are what is your primary means for verifying cleaning efficacy? So you're in their plant, you're manufacturing product, the variety of different means that you can use to ensure that your product um, contact services are in fact clean and sanitary sanitized before you proceed again. So again, what are your primary means? Again, ATP, microbial swabbing, allergen, review of CIP parameters, visual inspection, others are some options there. We'll just hang out a second as the responses finish building. All right. Well, it looks like um, we've got good responses there. And uh, just, you know, I just thought it'd be interesting to see where everyone's at. Um, primary means uh, many of you use some sort of ATP based technology, and that's excellent. I think that's, uh, that's what we, you know, in endorse and recommend at all in many of our training programs. Microbial swabbing is a, a, another tool that certainly can be deployed. Um, uh, protein and allergen swabbing is a, yet another tool. Um, you can simply look at CIP parameters. You know, did you hit or even COP parameters? Did you hit the right temperatures and concentrations and turbulence and all those parameters? Um, visual inspection is another tool that you know. That's you know, we use many of these in our processing facilities. But uh, good visual inspection is remains a very critical uh, um, part. We have another response here. I guess I didn't didn't ask what that might have been, but just I think it'd be healthy for us all to look at what everyone's doing. So thank you, thank you for your responses there. We're gonna ATP kind of figuring prominently uh, in this assessment. Let's look at one other question here um, across your organization. How confident are you that the cleaning procedures are adequately verified? So you're doing these, deploying these uh, tactics um, or these uh, technologies. What's your just Kind of curious what's your level of confidence with those assessments we'll let that uh, question incubate out there for a second here All right, if we look at those results, you know, kind of a bell-shaped curve from not sure at all to, uh, you know, we nailed it. Um, moderately confident is, uh, I think anyone who's uses a lot of scrutiny in cleaning and sanitizing recognizes that food plants are complex systems and, uh, and we need to be very careful about how they're run and operated and so forth. So again, just a couple of questions just to get us all thinking along the lines of you know, what we're using and our confidence with with um, our hygiene assessment technologies. So, so thank you everyone for your responses. Let me just give you a little overview of what I'll touch on today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about hygiene assessments and the role they have, certainly in the US where we've all been uh, living with FISMA for some for a few years yet uh, and um, all have uh, revisited or crafted and revisited our food safety plans quite a bit. I'm just going to 
just briefly touch on why they're so important. We'll talk a little bit about ATP basics. So uh, Dr. Bakke noted things like uh, adenylate and uh, um, AMP and all these different molecules. I'll just kind of go over that briefly so we have a little bit of understanding. Then I'll do some um, content on limitations and implications for this type of testing. I'm starting off with this slide. This is a publication that uh, we put out some time ago. It uses this is really points to a different assay that we use primarily in dairy. It's called the alkaline phosphatase test. And it's a technology, a test that we use to uh, you know, verify that we've actually pasteurized product, right? So many of you have seen you know, pasteurizers, they're very complicated, lots of plumbing, lots of moving parts. Uh, we run product through it. Did it actually pasteurize the milk is a key question. And one way we can verify that is to run this assay. My point in bringing this up is that um, when this assay was first developed, you know, it was a extremely valuable tool, but as the years progressed, we got better and better and better at under applying it and understanding its limitations. And that's somewhat of the nature of this presentation today is that uh, it follows a similar model to alkaline phosphatase has over the really decades that it's been deployed in the industry. So under the heading of hygiene assessments play um, um, uh, a, a, you know, a key role in our operations, um, there's a little bit of a challenge with that. So, so if, we're, we have, um, if you're a US company, you have uh, you know, fairly robust literacy with food safety plans under the Food Safety Modernization Act. And these two terms here, valid methods. So in other words, um, if you're going to run a test for coliform, for instance, in your product, you have to use a method that's that's valid, right? You can't just kind of invent something and oh, we tried this. No, you, you're you're really you're really compelled to use valid methods. So whatever control systems you have in place, um, FISMA pushes us to use valid methods. And also the other kind of big V word here is verifiable. So if we have critical um, preventative controls and processes nested in those, we have to make sure they're working, right? They have to be verified. So if it's a metal detector, we're putting through, you know, we're testing that. And, and, uh, and again, if we're cleaning and, and, and sanitizing, we also want to verify those. So just for that framework, um, in the world of many plants, there's a very narrow window for data generation. So we need assays that are quite rapid and um, we're also compelled to be as objective as we can with those assessments. So I still endorse visual inspection as a very valid way to, you know, that we should all be looking and smelling and listening, you know, to make sure our plant is operating properly. Um, but there is some subjectivity to that. And that's a little bit of a concern. So under FISMA, it is a little bit of a challenging role for if, if we're going to get quick data to do to use standard plating methods for bacteriological assessments and visual because of the time you know constraints in that i mean we may have a two three hour window where we're down for cleaning and we're right back up again it's difficult to get traditional microbial data in that window um and indeed visual inspection i've touched on that a little bit it can be you know quite subjective so atp assays came along some time ago they were really available kind of in the 60s and they became kind of a practical tool in the 90s. They were able to assess hygiene. Uh, they were really regarded as fairly objective, you know, properly handled and deployed. And uh, they're very quick. In a matter of a couple of minutes, we could kind of declare a particular surface in good shape or in need of uh, additional attention. There has been some concern though over the last, uh, you know, five or 10 years regarding this phenomena we call ATP depletion. And that's been the basis of some of our studies over the last few years. So again, under the heading of hygiene assessments play a key role. Um, well, the outcomes of loss of control are big, right? We've all seen those headlines. This slide, it's fuzzy by design. I'm trying to hide some of the details and the identity of this particular case and so forth. But, you know, it's Listeria, it's Salmonella, it's Campylobacter. You all know the top 10 list of you know, pathogens that can be in our food. And uh, many food plants are quite large. You know, our product is crossing state lines, it's in large areas. And uh, when we do lose control, 
we're, you know, the implications are quite weighty. I, I know you all know that, but I'm just sort of touching on that briefly here. Um, in that particular case, um, um, you know, FDA under their Form 483 uh, authority, they came into the facilities involved in that, that case uh, that I just showed, and they did a fairly thorough inspection of the facility. Um, FDA inspection reports are, in fact, um, a, a, um, redacted ones are available through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, they used to be published or posted online. Um, so under the idea of, you know, learn from mistakes, you know, hopefully other people's, let's read what FDA found in that plant uh, from just the previous slide where they had a listeria outbreak. So this is this verbatim language from the FDA report. So the point, bullet point number one says specifically, you failed to demonstrate your cleaning and sanitizing program is effective in controlling microbial contaminations. And it's really important that you watch the wording here. They did not say, your cleaning and sanitizing program is ineffective, they say you failed to demonstrate that it was. And that's same sort of rationale is echoed in similar logic throughout that report. So again, under FISMA, we don't not only have to use, you know, legitimate valid methods, we have to verify that they're working. And that's the data that, you know, FDA and others want to see. Okay, so that brings us to a little bit of uh, what are the basics of ATP? It's an organic molecule. It's, it's present in pretty much every living organism, including food soils, certainly, you know, you know meats and vegetables, and uh, um, it's in milk, it's in a host of different things. And um, it's also in food soils where we have microbial growth. So if we've got, you know, fermenting, a fermenting material, we'll have lots of ATP because of the outgrowth of the uh, microorganisms in it. A little detail about the molecule, you know, I don't want to burden you with that. Um, it's a form of uh, energy used for all, all biological systems. So anytime bacteria are metabolizing or their, their or microorganisms or tissue is metabolizing, they are burning ATP, okay? And you could also say that uh, if ATP is found, we kind of conclude that food soil is present. That's our, our key, um, assumption here, and to a great degree, it's an absolutely valid assumption to, to state and to make. We should also recognize though the ATP is very reactive. So if you look at this molecule, it's not, it, you know, it's got a lot of stuff on it, right? It's got these phosphate groups, these negative charges, a lot of, you know, what we would call chemical moieties on it that make it attractive for various uh, react reactions to occur. And in fact, it does. So ATP is readily transformed into ADP, which is transformed into ATP, AMP, and so forth, and it can be reversed. So we can take AMP, go to ADP, and end up with ATP. So another point to remember is ATP is very reactive, and it can follow this particular cycle, if you will. So again, on the basics, how is it used? ATP as a molecule, in fact, energizes a light-inducing reaction, this very same reaction you see in um, lightning bugs or fireflies, whatever, wherever, however you want to refer to this insect, right? And uh, the we know the chemistry of that, and it literally makes light. So we get ATP and the right uh, chemistry of that insect around, and boom, it'll glow. And that's why we see, you know, a nice uh, warm Wisconsin uh, summer evening. We'll see fireflies floating around, and we'll see that little little light that they um, emit. The chemistry of that includes some, some um, enzymes and some um, protein, but it includes ATP. If we put ATP in it, it will go, it'll make light. So we, we adopt that same technology because the light is quantifiable and, it and used in this application it correlates to the soil load on food, on processing equipment, or, you know, can be in medical applications. It can be used in a lot of applications. So we have a luminometer as part of the technology. We have a swab that includes all the right chemistry except for ATP. We swab a food contact surface um, with that swab, introducing ATP. We stick it back, stick that swab in the luminometer and voila, it detects the light that's generated. And again, the quantity of that light is related to the quantity of soil on, this, on, the, on the surface that we just swabbed. 
what do these things look like? Uh, so half of you use these, you know, technologies, so you know very well what they look like. But just just to give everyone a sense, a, kind of a handheld thing, look like an old cell phone, right? Uh, uh, there's some swabs here. This is just a screen grab from you know looking what these uh, ATP um, monitoring devices look like. Very portable, you know, pretty pretty convenient technology. Mikio noted, um, or Dr. Bucke noted this idea of ATP cycling. So under the basics of ATP, again, I just want to emphasize that uh, ATP is kind of on the move, right? It can be readily dephosphorylated into AMP and ADP, and those molecules can be phosphorylated back to ATP. And understanding this technology is a critical thing because if we have ATP on a surface, so for most food soils, ATP is being burned it's being utilized, right? So those microorganisms, they are churning away at the pool of ATP, and as a, and as a result, it starts to de get depleted. We generate ADP and AMP, um, but under the right chemistry, we can recycle those, which is the focus of uh, uh, Dr. Bakke's discoveries and uh, along with his colleagues at, at Kikoman. So again, just revisiting this idea that ATP can be is reactive and it can be recycled as it's dephosphorylated into the other uh, adenylate homologs like ADP and ADP. And that was kind of the focus of this particular study. And all we, this study essentially shows this. Over time in food soil, um, whether it's uh, a eukaryotic or prokaryotic, prokaryotic cells around, they simply burn up ATP, right? They have no more fuel left, there's no more nutrients around, or they're under stress of cleaning chemistries or sanitizing chemistries, the ATP goes down. It goes down quite a bit. And you can, I've attached some publications to this presentation, to this uh, podcast, you can go pour through those. And there are others that, that uh, I'd be happy to provide if need be, but uh, just understand that principle. ATP is around at first, everything grows out and then they start to deplete. And then, uh, well, you can maybe perhaps see where I'm going here. Uh, again, most soils and tissues contain ATP at first, and that's great, but under stress and star starvation, the ATP becomes, is depleted. And so the ATP concentration goes down and the test sensitivity. So if your assay is looking for ATP, it will be less sensitive as a result under conditions of ATP depletion. However, the soil, right, the thing we're trying to get rid of, we're trying to verify that it's that the, the CIP cycle has done its job, the soil is still there. We just can't see it as well if we're using a device that simply looks for ATP. Um, so anyway, this kind of just says, this, says the same thing with this bottom bullet point here. It says, however, if we can recycle the ATP, the, the ATP or the AMP and ADP back into ATP, we regain our light again and we can now see uh, the soil again. So that's uh, the basis of a study that we did. And here's a, just a screen capture of that particular study. Um, what we did in that study is we went into um, a meat facility and a, a dairy facility, and we just swabbed with uh, both um, with uh, different technologies of um, ATP or adenylate assessments. And all this slide says really, at least for this podcast, is we, we sampled thousands of sites in these two plants. So not quite 2,000 assays were run just to see how these technologies compare against each other. One, just looking for ATP, and the other, uh, able to look for all three adenylate homologs. Here's kind of the hypothesis. Uh, I think Mary Beth will show some like-minded control diagrams. If you're looking for a, uh, if you're looking for adenylate in a processing facility, I have a picture here. Maybe it's a, you know, a cleaned. Now, this is a filling head for a, you know, a cup filler on ice cream. So if you're sampling that with ATP, you know, all the time, you will, you will establish kind of a track record. You know, you'll clean well most of the time, but every once in a while you won't. And you'll get very high levels of ATP. And that is a signal to your um, CIP crew, uh, go back and clean it again, right? So we see these deviations in process. That's exactly what you know, FISMA sort of compels us to do, clean and sanitize, but verify that it's been working. So we'll see most of our data kind of in this uh, zone here, and there are a variety of different ways for modeling this, but every once in a while, we'll see these process deviations. 
So we use that as a model um, to look at, to compare these two different types of assays. Um, the first one really um, looks for all adenylate, right? All ATP, ADP, and AMP. The other looks just for um, ATP. And the hypothesis was if we're just looking for ATP, we will have um, events where the ATP is depleted and we'll miss them. And we won't, again, we're kind of blind to them. We call that a false negative. It's negative reading on our luminometer, but it's false because we just missed the ATP present because it was depleted into ADP or AMP. And that's pretty much what we saw. Um, this is a table from our study. I'm just gonna highlight one zone, one you know part of it. And uh, again, I've provided some of these to the podcast and you can go and access those and read all the fine detail. But essentially when we use the assay to look for all of the adenylates, we found over those 2000 assessments, we found about 130 um, process deviations. In other words, it wasn't clean enough. If we just use ATP, looking at those exact same venues, we only found 64. So, so that we presented this study as evidence that this hypothesis that you know, ATP is being depleted and we're losing sensitivity yielded this type of outcome, which we feel is compelling evidence to suggest that um, that that the AXP technology is going to be more sensitive to picking up uh, loss of control where cleaning and sanitation is, is critical. All right, um, again, just to conclude, a little overview of why hygiene assessments are so important, a little bit on the basics, some limitations, and to conclude, ATP assays uh, are susceptible to ATP depletion. And this, the ATP recycling technology increases our sensitivity. It brings uh, the, the, the tool, which is this ability to generate light because of ATP, it, it, it brings back our sensitivity and allows us to see those process deviations. All right. Well, thank you for your time and attention. Quick overview of a lot of work. I'll now turn the time uh, over to Mar Mary Beth, who will talk about another applied view on this technology. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Mary Beth Karczynski, and I'm from Weber Scientific. And I just want to take a moment just to look at or talk to ATP from a timeline historical perspective. As Dr. Rankin mentioned, you know, ATP goes back to the early 90s, late 80s. Um, NASA was the first team to really take ATP, house it commercially, and the company that I had worked for for the time at the time was Lumac, and they were based in the Netherlands. And they were the first company to really penetrate the food and beverage marketplace and uh, really bring it, you know, from a, uh, a tool that can really help everyone. So Dr. Rankin has kind of taken us to a different level. So back in the old days, so to speak, 1985, when we're really working with a LUMAC perspective, you know, hand pipetting chemistries and whatnot, you know, or, or it was better than what was currently available, meaning traditional methods. So now we have a, a 10 second test that we can introduce for rapid assessment for sanitation control. But back, even back then, customers would say, are we missing anything? Could we be missing something? So, you know, the whole idea of having the A3 technology introducing ATP, ADP, and AMP has been a tool that many of the customers from Weber Scientific have found to be beneficial. So we serve a lot of different markets. Um, you know, we go into meat, poultry, dairy, seafood, you know, flavors and ingredients and, and beer, just to, just to name a few. So what I'd like to do is just take a moment and walk you through a case study at Great Central Brewing Company. Uh, they introduced A3 into their hygiene curriculum and really generated great results and a great hygiene program. So if you can see the case study, you know, what are they trying to achieve or what do they want at the end of the day? They want sanitation control and they want to really eliminate spoilage organisms. You know, also keep an eye on lack of pasteurization and identify a broad range of contamination. So who are they? They're located out in Chicago, Illinois. You know, they're a craft contract brewery and it's a hundred barrel brew house. So, you know, this is a larger company looking for improvements for their sanitation curriculum. 
So if I may show you another slide, uh, what they wanted to do is dial in on hotspots and they identified four. So there was a can filler head, a canning bubble breaker, undercover gasser, can line conveyor belt. And what they did was really check their RLU values over a four month test period. So what did they find? Well, one thing that you have to take into consideration, regardless of what um, ATP company you're using, you have to really define your own cutoffs. Everybody will make recommendations, but you really need to take it and test it out in your own facility. So from a, a great central perspective, they had different types of results. So I just want to look for one moment. Um, you know, the initial results from the can filler header that exceeded the safe RLU values that was prescribed. So if you go on to really look on what that breaks down to, um, it demonstrates the fact that there are different RLU cutoffs. So the max RLU cutoff for the first area that we're looking at is 85. So it's a four month period. You can see firsthand how they really improved their sanitation curriculum. Uh, they really had initially a hot hit or you know a positive hit. And then if you go down two months later, another positive and lastly, borderline. So it demonstrates pretty clear, you know, where they're at. It, from a 10 second tool perspective, you're not gonna get anything easier or more uh, faster from a rapid method perspective than that. If you look over at the bubble breaker, the max RLU was 182. And again, if you look at the four month test period, you can see they really were only encountered by using this tool, a one area hotspot, which was kind of in, an, in their initial testing. And then lastly, you know, the other two spots you can see, um, with the max threshold of 678 RLU. And, and I just want to take a moment and, and address that. So when you think about cutoffs, what should we be thinking? Well, from a, a Kikoman perspective, we have a cutoff of 200 to 400 RLUs for smooth surfaces. And then we have a cutoff suggested for porous surfaces, and that's 500 to 1,000. So when you look at the undercover gasser, we're talking about a pretty porous surface, and that's how we determine 678 as our cutoff. And then if you look lastly over at the conveyor, again, you can see firsthand based upon our results where they hit and how this tool was able to demonstrate their um, improvement in their sanitation curriculum. So, you know, again, with a max of 85, and then you look closely at where we hit, um, the proof is in the, in the data points that we're looking at. Now, if we go on and you see, this is where we started. And you can see we had a positive. If you go down a little farther, you can see we only had one more and I believe the third month. And then lastly, that, that final kind of quasi hit. So from a 10 second tool, you know, you're getting a real, from a 10 second test, you're getting a great tool from a sanitation perspective. Moving on, again, undercover gasser, max threshold of 678 you know, our, our, we're just going straight down. We're able to dial into our sanitation program and really get a maximum benefit from it. That's very impressive. Moving on to the next, all four test points had significant RLU decreases. What that gave Great Central is a more consistent sanitation control. And that increased the level of cleanliness in the brewery. Moving on, so here's just some feedback. A great central brewing company, plant hygiene greatly improved in a short amount of time. In a four month test period, that it demonstrates from the data points right there. The RLU data has led to significant improvements in plant hygiene in a short amount of time. Uh, the QC team can also see immediate results about contamination by observing the RLU data. You know, seeing is believing. <clears throat> so when they wait for the data on the swabs, it takes a few days. So having accurate and reliable RL RLU data, it's a, it's a powerful tool. It speeds up the packing processes and it's helpful in maintaining overall cleanliness and hygiene. Okay, so considerations, you know, what do you have to think about? How is the data from your current meter collected? How is it analyzed? How do you maintain it? 
archive it for long-term evaluations. The next point, are you fully utilizing the capabilities of your current meter? And if not, why not? Is it too complex, prohibitive, inaccessible, unhelpful? Um, you know, when, when Dr. Rankin put the, the, the poll and I saw that, you know, about 45% were actually using ATP, uh, you know, I, I would have thought if I had to guess, I would have thought it would have been higher, a higher percentage of people because this tool has been around and has been used successfully since my days at LUMAC, which are back to 1980. So moving on, how do you prom promote and maintain proper sampling technique on a consistent basis? And that's really important. So if you're gonna implement this tool in your, in your facility uh, and you have a team of five people, it's really important that all five people are doing the same sort of sampling technique. What, what does that really mean? That means like a four by four inch squared and you do the proper cross hatching, just like you would do with traditional uh, environmental swabbing, you know, up and up and down, side to side. Okay, is the data you collect easily access, accessible by central personnel? Do you have a way to view data collected remotely in order to make improvements without physically being there? You know, and what are the limitations to your current meter in detecting ADP, and how do those limitations, you know, really affect you? Um, I'm going to take a moment. Let me just see for a second. Okay, I just wanted to take a quick note. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. <clears throat> ATP tests for, clean, for cleaning and sanitation verification are widely used in a myriad of food and beverage com companies. Uh, it's been shown by the University of Wisconsin Medicine and in practic practical applications that ATP can degrade. So are we missing something if it's degrading? By, make, this, by, by missing something, we're making conventional ATP tests inappropriate for sanitation verification in many applications. You know, is it really a useful tool? So this issue can be overcome by using the advanced enzyme chemistry that allows the test to detect all three adenolates and asso that's associated with ATP, which is our A3 technology. So Kikkoman's LucyPak A3 ATP test accomplishes this and has been shown to be more sensitive than common tests or, or, or common food types. Um, it, it really gives you a fast and more accurate feedback that can be used to improve your food sanitation program. You know, so you're getting your results in 10 seconds. The A3 technology, it's, it collects the same as traditional ATP tests. The difference really is in the chemistry, as Dr. Rankin explained. The higher sensitivity creates a better level of detection, which is really important at the end of the day. So we have hygiene monitoring in three easy steps, as you can see. Um, you're going to take your swab, put it into the meter. You can visualize the data with an app, and you can access it anywhere with, a, with our, our ability with cloud storage. And then lastly, you know, thank you. I appreciate your time. And I hope that, you know, as we discuss ATP and how do we take it to the next level, to make it an even better tool. I mean, we're all, our whole goal is food quality. So this is a tool that can help improve our food quality. That's the name of the game. All right, thank you so much for your time, everyone. So before we have our presenters address some of the questions that have been submitted through the program, I'd like to quickly remind you that we'd love your feedback in our webinar survey to help improve our programs. Now, uh, let's get started with a few questions from the audience. All right, so let's see. Um, first question here is going to be for uh, Dr. Bakke. So the question is, is this product AOAC certified? Uh, yes, uh, Kikkoman A3 is uh, validated under AOAC PTM program. Okay, great, thanks for that answer. 
All right. Um, another question that we have, um, and I will just kind of open this up to uh, everyone and um, whoever feels like answering it can go ahead. All right. The question is, I've heard that different ATP tests give varying baseline thresholds for a pass fail. Is this true? And if so, how do you know which um, lumino, lumino, uh, sorry, luminometer, <laughs> I hope I said that right, luminometer value to go off of? And how do you know if your upper limit is adequate? So I, I can actually jump in there. So that, that's an excellent question. Great. Um, Thanks, Mary each, Beth. each, No problem. Um, each luminometer will, each company who provides a luminometer will have their own suggested RLU cutoffs. So, you know, as I mentioned before with Kikoman, depending upon the surface, you know, we have the uh, smooth surfaces, our cutoffs are 200 to 400. And then for more porous surfaces, we have 500 to 1,000. I would always recommend a customer to do some you know, in-house testing on their own. So even though that's a recommendation, is that applicable to your facility? We have a customer using the Kiko Mountain system that even though our cutoff is 200, they dial it down to 50 RLUs. So their cutoff, they took it upon themselves to establish this, is 50. So that, that's what they feel. So so any any company that you're currently using, you know, abide by what they suggest. But I suggest also that each individual takes it upon themselves to, to do some in-house testing. So, to, you know, kind of if you have a HACCP plan established and you know what your critical control points are, test, retest, test and retest and start to build your own data points to see what RLU value is really pertinent to each facility. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. Um, all right, so another question. This one is for Dr. Rankin. Uh, you mentioned testing for AMP and ADP is beneficial in some applications. Which situations is it better for? Well, um, I think under any food processing circumstances, you can have conditions where you um, can have ATP depletion. So it could be dairy, meat, vegetables, um, um, any sort of condition, really any processing can have ATP depletion. So, um, so there really isn't a circumstance that is, uh, you know, specifically either exclusionary or, or otherwise for an assay that can get to all adenylates. So I would suggest that it's, you know, part of your, part of your, um, you know, growing scrutiny on, um, on how you're managing plant hygiene. And again, I think the main message that we've discovered here is that this, this, uh, an assay that can get to all adenylates is going to be more sensitive. So the previous question was kind of saying, well, what's the, what's the borderline, right? Like, well, to some degree, that's, you know, that's for you to defend, right? And to defend to your clients and customers, your insurance companies and things like that, as well as your own sort of internal sense of, you know, how clean do we need to be? Uh, if you're making medical equipment, you know, very little tolerance, right? For you know, hygiene trouble, right? Uh, if you're making something that's gonna be, you know, repasteurized and reprocessed, maybe not quite as stringent. Um, so, so again, I don't know of any circumstances where AX or the, you know, A3, uh, if you will, technology would have uh, um, a, a particular disadvantage over standard ATP assays. Okay, thank, thanks, Dr. Rankin. Uh, I have another question for you, Dr. Rankin. Um, what are some of the conditions or causes that likely lead to ATP depletion? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. You know, um, so if so, if you think of food soil, right, there is a static amount of um, nutrients in there, and as microorganisms grow or the tissue itself continues to metabolize, it's going to burn up those nutrients, and then the cells are kind of in a starvation mode. So, time is one big factor. Time between when you clean and run the assay is one factor that will yield ATP depletion. Temperatures, so if you're operating the plant and it's all uh, 
you know, uh, very cold, 35 degrees Fahrenheit versus, um, you know, maybe tempered air in a plant where it's uh, 75 uh, temperature. So the warmer it is, the faster those metabolic systems are going to run. There's some indications that other chemistries will, will destroy or um, um, deteriorate ATP, things like, uh, you know, sanitizers and cleaning chemistries and things like that. But those are, you know, some pretty key ones that will result in ATP depletion. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. Um, another question here for Dr. Bakke. Uh, the attendee asks, can we try this product at our site? Are free, are free trial samples available? Yes. Uh, please inquire to uh, with, uh, with a scientific. Okay, great. So you can inquire with their scientific department yeah. and they'll be happy to help you out with that. Um, thank you, Dr. Bakke. Uh, all right, so I have um, a question here for Mary Beth. How do I know if I am having these false negatives with my ATP test? Okay, so a couple of things that you want to do is uh, do a known positive. <clears throat> so if you think there's a, a false negative to, to confirm it, you know, take a clean swab, swab an area that's a known contaminant and then run it in your unit. That, that's the best way to do it. So to, to do a down and dirty, for lack of a better example, swab your hand, um, swab the floor in the production area, something like that. That should undoubtedly rule out if it's a negative, you know, if, if there's something wrong and you believe that you're picking up only false negatives. Okay, great. Thanks, Mary Beth. Um, all right, another question here for Dr. Rankin. How do we compare RLU with UFC? Or maybe CFUs, is that? Yeah, I, I think that was what, but, yeah, I believe that was what. Yeah. That. So really what you're asking is, so the luminometer will generate um, a number, right? And that's a function of how much ATP was presented to the swab and the, the, the hardware and software of the luminometer will generate a number for you. So that's an RLU, re, um, relative light units. And uh, so, so CFU is really relating to the microbial load on a, a surface. So if you take, so, um, so if you take a, a, um, a, if you do microbial swab of a food contact surface that's really rich in soil, right? It's very contaminated. You'll see huge um, microbial numbers. And if you take a swab of that area, you'll see uh, for ATP rather for adenylate, you'll also see very high numbers, lots of ATP, lots of bacteria. And, and conversely, if you see a surface, it's extremely clean and uh, you swab it for microbes and swab it for um, adenylate, you'll see low numbers on both counts. However, um, that correlation, and there are a large number of studies who have tried to establish that correlation there are so many unique circumstances that deviate from a, a very strong correlation. So I've seen correlations, you know, on the order of 50, 60 percent, something like that. In other words, um, adenylate values will predict about 50 to 60 percent of CFU values, not super correlated because when we're looking for it, adenylate, we're not just looking for microorganisms, we're looking for a broader category of soil that is rich in adenylate. And that can cause some significant deviations between CFU values, uh, microbial load, bacterial load, and the RLU values. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. Uh, here's another question that I'm going to throw out to the group and whoever would like to answer, um, please go ahead. What is the best way to create an ATP plan? Any I, I'll, I'll <laughs> jump in. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Um, Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, no problem. So how to, how, with the best way, 
as far as creating an ATP plan. I mentioned before about critical control points. So, you know, many people that might be listening have already established a HACCP curriculum. So <clears throat> HACCP stands for Hazard Analysis of Critical Control Points. So with that being said, <clears throat> if you've established critical critical control points, follow in suit with what you've already established, right? That That's the easiest, the, the path of least resistance. Other than that, you have to take some time and look at your processes and see where you're vulnerable. So, you know, walk walk the production area, see see where you're, you're potentially could have an issue and create your plan from there. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I would just also add just to start, right? So get moving, you know, down the path of an uh, of a, a using a, a dentalate based assessment tool. And as you walk the plant, you walk the floor, you 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 inspect, you know, you know what areas of your CIP circuits are difficult to clean or or food contact services that you have very little tolerance for, you know, hygiene events, uh, you know, finished product packaging and things like that and just start collecting data, right? And it'll generate for you a, um, you know, a pattern of your hygiene. And that my, so, it, I, so part of the process of, of having a good hygiene program is it's iterative. As you run it, it tells, it teaches you what's working and what's not. The key role for a dental aid is there are very few tools that you can use to make an objective, a fast objective <coughs> assessment. Otherwise, it's like, eh, it looks pretty good, you know, or or microbial data that's, you know, a few days out. So again, start, understand that it's iterative. It's going to teach you where things are going awry, um, make it in concert with other assessments, perhaps um, shelf life studies or otherwise. The microbial data is also very important to look at as well. But, um, but again, it's the only real tool you have objective tool you have to go in the plant and make rapid assessments of the state of hygiene. Great, great answers both. All right, we have time for about one more question. So um, here's another question for you, Dr. Rankin. How do you know when to use ATP testing over protein or other hygiene indicators testing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, in general, um, you know, protein is typically deployed when we're, we have some sort of preventative measure relative to allergens. So we have particular protein, you know, a soy protein or dairy or something like that, that we're trying to control. Um, ATP uh, or dentalate assays, can, excuse me, can be deployed very, very broadly. So if we're really concerned about, so for instance, if you're running um, uh, protein swabs and your soil happens to be lipid based, you won't see it, right? If it, you know, um, as, as, so again, we're, we're, the, the issue here is we're trying to control soils. And soils can be lipid-based, they can be protein, they can be, you know, carbohydrate, they can be minerals, and we, they can be these microbial biofilms. They're a large collection of stuff, and ATP or adenylate-based assays are gonna give you the broadest tool to control all those forms of soil. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. So that's all the time that we have for questions today on this webinar, but please join me in thanking Dr. Miki Obake, Dr. Scott Rankin, and Mary Beth Karczynski for their presentations, as well as our sponsor, Kikomon.